I'm Jackson, and my colleagues Erica, Victoria, and Tommy and I, we are going to talk about Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So uh, three quick images here just to kind of get things rolling. This is a really good 3D uh, animated representation of what the bacteria looks like uh, based on SEMs. And we have two uh, instances here of some of the nastier infections that can be caused. This is a lung taken on autopsy of a patient with cystic fibrosis. And you can see these little yellow dots here are actually biofilms formed by the, uh, by the Pseudomonas aeruginosa in that lung during the course of the infection. On the top we have, as we will find out, this is a gelatinase positive organism. So this is uh, a case of necrotizing fasciitis in a 60-year-old female patient. Uh, she underwent surgery but did not, did not survive this, unfortunately. So, all right. So the basics of, of our guy, gram-negative coccobacillus. So we have an intermediate structure between sphere and rod. It thrives across a wide range of environments. It's kind of an understatement. This, uh, this bacteria works just about anywhere. It's, it's very, uh, very robust. It's an opportunistic pathogen, and it's, it's a zoonotic uh, uh, pathogen, interestingly enough. So we're not the only uh, species that can be affected. Uh, so let's talk about etymology and a little bit of history here. Uh, so this was discovered in 1882 by a French chemist and bacteriologist, and he gave it the name Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, mona, you know, just being Latin for like a unit, one individual thing. We don't know a pseudo for a false unit. We don't know why he gave it that, um, that name. It's like not find any information to that regard. But aeruginosa is Latin for rusted copper, and so... Uh, this was this was an name given to it because it has very distinct coloration patterns in culture. We can see a few examples of that up here. Uh, one of the main reasons for seeing these different coloration patterns is, and give the next line here, is pyocyanin. So it produces a lot of, of, of pigments, but this is an important one because not only does it cause pigments in culture, um, so we can see something when we culture it, but it also is important from a... Uh, pathophysiological perspective because that, you know, the presence of this increases interleukin-8 secretory activity in the respiratory epithelium. And so for patients, especially with cystic fibrosis, um, this can be a really big risk factor for diffuse bronchopneumonia, which is a problem. And that's going to be synergistic with other inflammatory cytokines. So that can cause uh, generalized inflammation that's pretty negative overall. So metabolically, we have that it is an obligate arrow. Uh, it, it is not capable of fermentation, but it can use uh, nitrate as an electron receptor, but it can only do so in a respiratory fashion. Um, it is able to function in low oxygen environments very well, and as an interesting side note, this guy can uh, actually grow pretty well in fuel tanks, and so causes corrosion sometimes in uh, petroleum fuel tanks with diesel and that type of thing. It's chemo-organotrophic, and unluckily for us, uh, an optimal temperature is 37 degrees Celsius for its growth, so we are a perfect host for this guy. So, why do we care? What's, what's really important here? Um, it is a nosocomial, uh, of great nosocomial concern. Uh, patients that are immunocompromised are especially at risk, patients uh, especially at risk. Patients under the category of HIV AIDS, people with severe burns, cancer, or cystic fibrosis, when they have, uh, when they are nosocomially infected, with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, their case fatality rate hovers about 50%, so pretty nefarious in that regard. Three big things, and this will be expounded upon by my colleagues momentarily, that are really bad about this is, as I said, it's gelatinase positive. So as we saw in the opening slide, the potential for necrotizing fasciitis is definitely there, and that's you know, quite of concern. It's gram-negative, so obviously LPS, the polysaccharide, is endotoxin, can engender septicemia, and as we had uh, mentioned earlier, interleukin-8 secretory activity, and this is from the pyocyanin, once again, uh, very important in inflammation in the respiratory epithelium, diffuse bronchopneumonia being uh, quite a concern. So now to get a uh, closer look at some of the infective potentials here. Erica? Um, okay, so some of the characteristics of uh, pseudomonas aeruginosa that help it cause disease. Um, it is an opportunistic pathogen. Um, it uh, is mainly found with your immunocompromised patients, like Jackson said, cancer, HIV, burn units. Also, those patients that are having things poked where they don't naturally belong, um, your catheters, ventilators, etc. It is motile and contains gelatinase, so it can move from tissue to tissue, infecting multiple organ systems. 
Um, so it can move and it can eat anything in its life. And also you can find it um, pretty much in places that you really don't want to be finding it because it can survive on little nutrients. So you can find it in um, distilled water and hand sanitizer. Incidents, it is primarily an osteocomial infection. Um, those going into the hospital, um, it's at 5.4% already have an infection. 10 to 20 will get it um, in the hospital, and about 4.4% have it when they leave. Um, it does have almost a 15% mortality rate, and of patients with pseudomonosorginosa, um, you can find it in urine, sputum, surgical wounds, skin lesions. 39% um, of the time you can find it in the nose, 39% of the time in the throat, and 29% of the time in the stool. Also, 75% of patients with tracheostomies had pseudomonosorginosa in their tracheostomy wounds. So that's colonization, not necessarily infection with those two numbers. Actual diseases, um, pneumonia, so uh, inflammation of the lungs, uh, putting pus into the air sacs, uh, meningitis, infection of meninges, which are the coverings of the brain and spinal cord, endocarditis, infection of the inner lining of the heart, um, usually caused um, by septicemia, so infection in the blood, getting into the heart and spreading it. Uh, Enthalpomitis, which I have an image here of the eyeball, it's an um, infection of the vitreous tumors in the eye. Uh, GI infections, UTIs, dermatitis, and malignant external titis, which is uh, also known as swimmer's ear. The thing with this is that it can uh, spread from here, going into the bone, nerves, and or brain. So pretty much inflammation of any and all tissues. So basically what the thing is, Main thing with this, it's a huge nosocomial transmission thing. Especially, you need to beware the tap water. The tap water is going to kill you. So it just says it creates these biofilms, which allow it to persist in the hospital water systems very, very readily and make it very difficult to get out. So the thing is, it's um, the major waterborne pathogen in immune-compromised people, such as people in ICUs, burn units. Uh, neonatal units and such as that, Cut, and it consists of nearly 50% of waterborne infections, so it's a big, big problem, like I said. Um, and they did a few studies of seeing the isolates and seeing how many were actually drug resistant. Nearly 54% of them were resistant to at least two different uh, common antibiotics, and most of them were resistant to at least one. So, and the numbers are rising from multi-drug resistance, so it could continue to be a problem if we don't figure out something to help prevent these now. Like I said, oh, sorry. And, so, yeah, and then also, they test the water systems, even in Western cultures and stuff, nearly 82% of all hospital water systems were positive for biofilms in this, so it is a big problem. So, since it is such a big problem, there are a few different things that can be done in order to prevent its spread. Because the best thing is to not get it in the first place, especially in the IC unit. So, one of the main things is rapid monitoring. So, basically testing for it in the water system so you know it's there and can then implement other things to get it and perhaps prevent it from getting worse. Uh, one of the most effective ways that they found for rapid and cheap is a 16S RNA gene-based PCR assay, which is here. Basically, they're just doing any, like, deleterious PCRs, I'm sure all of us have done plenty of times, uh, to see if it's there or not. And then, so if they do find it, what they can use and what has been shown to be very effective is point-of-use water filtration systems, such as this here which is basically a filter that they put on the end of the taps so that that filters out the organism and then also other very common waterborne pathogens in like ICU units because for the most part people who are healthy don't have to worry about it and their bodies can fend it off so that's why it's like point of use and basically focusing ICUs and stuff. Another way that they've shown to help prevent the spread of it is copper and silver ionization of water systems. Basically way to disinfect the water system that's maybe a little more affected than some of the usages now. You can kind of be seen here. What it's doing is, this is the pseudomonas and 
the copper and the silver are basically causing penetration of the membrane and causing everything in the inside to come out, and it does. You know, having outside, insides out, it's kind of a bad thing. And then, of course, proper hygiene precautions, so you should still always wash your hands, but also do that, and then make sure you don't know, spread it to other people and do whatever. All right, so now we're going to go into um, a little bit of the treatment for pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, so it is a bacterium, so of course uh, antibiotics are going to be your most effective treatment. But uh, it is very, very antibiotic resistant, um, and the resistant rates have been increasing over the years. So this, uh, this chart shows um, they took uh, six different... Uh, antibiotics, and they charted the resist. They they tracked the resist the percent increase in resistance to these antibiotics over um, five years. So from 1996 to 2000, uh, some of them didn't really have that big of an increase. Um, like for example, um, where is it? P uh, piperacillin went from like 12 percent to what was that like 15 and a half? Not that big of a deal. Um, but ciprofloxacin. Uh, Ciprofloxacin uh, went from about 18% to a 29% uh, resistance. Um, and this shows um, they took the same six antibiotics. Oh, thank you. Um, and it's they took uh, they took uh, isolates from hospitals in the United States um, around 10,000 each. Uh, this one only had 8,000. I don't know why they went from 8,000 to 11,000. They took a very large amount of samples from hospitals, and they checked how many of these drugs they were resistant to. Um, so around 50% were uh, susceptible to all of the drugs, but then when you come over here, about 1% of uh, all the isolates taken were resistant to six antibiotics. Um, so when you're taking, you know, out of around 10,000, uh, that's a that's a pretty large number of isolates uh, that are antibiotic resistant. And that can lead to a lot of problems um, with treatment, especially because it's such an uh, infective pathogen. So there's several uh, factors that help to contribute to its um, antibiotic resistance. So morphologically, it's gram-negative, so it has the outer cell uh, membrane, uh, and that helps with its permeability resistance, so antibiotics have a harder time entering the cell. Um, also, it grows in biofilms in the environment as well as uh, inside of uh, patients. Um, the polysaccharide matrix that forms in its biofilms also contribute to the, uh, the permeability resistance, and this is a, a big problem with uh, patients who have cystic fibrosis as a, as a result of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, but the biggest contributing factor to its antibiotic resistance is that it has very high upregulation of efflux pumps um, in the cell membrane. So the efflux pumps. Uh, pump out um, toxins in front of, that would be uh, that would be uh, dangerous to the cell from the cytoplasm, um, and they can remove. And they have a pseudomonas aeruginosa that has a lot of different efflux pumps in its cell membrane for different antibiotics. Um, and this is just a couple examples. It can move a lot of remove a lot of beta lactams, uh, fluoro, um, fluoroquinolones, and uh, marcoloids. Um, and there was, there's like a huge list of them that it can remove. Um, and the permeant, the resistance as a result of the efflux pumps is additive with its uh, permeability resistance. So, yay, that's a lot of resistance. <laughs> it's very, very dangerous. So what does work? Um, obviously, there are still some antibiotics that work. Not all, like not every strain is going to be susceptible to every antibiotic. Um, but there are some that work a little bit better than others. So a lot of aminoglycosides are very effective against Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa. Um, they inhibit the they they help by inhibiting protein synthesis by binding to ribosomes and give rise to an accurate mRNA translation. Um, the, uh, the aminoglycosides remain effective uh, to about seventy to ninety eight percent of isolates taken from hospitals in the United States. However, because it is such a resistant bacterium, there were some isolates taken from Turkey and Southeast Asia uh, that had aminoglycoside modifying enzymes. So 
and you know, not everything is always going to be effective. Um, Emipenem is another uh, example of an effective antibiotic against Pseudomonas ceruginosa. Um, it inhibits cell wall synthesis. Um, it's not as reliant as a lot of other antibiotics uh, because it has a high uh, rate of um, mutation uh, to like mutational resistance to it uh, in the loss of the OPRD porin. Um, the OPRD porin is uh, it's a transmembrane uh, port that uh, a lot of antibiotics can get access to. So when the Pseudomonas aeruginosa loses the OPRD porin, uh, amipenin can no longer enter the cell, so it can't affect it anymore. And then lastly, uh, meropenem. Um, it's uh, it's higher. It's it's a very. This is a, one of the most uh, reliable um, antibiotics against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's uh, it, it's resistant to degradation by beta lactamases, um, and it also works by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. And it's, it's preferred over a lot of other drugs because it requires a mutation in the loss of the OPRD porin as well as uh, increased efflux pumps for a lot of other antibiotics. You only need to either have a loss of the OPRD or uh, the uh, increased um, efflux pump regulation. But with this one, it requires a mutation in both to become resistant to it. And that's it. All right, so that's everything we have. One important thing to take away is that while, yes, as we demonstrated, it is very virulent pathogen. It is opportunistic. So just because someone has a colony, has uh, the presence of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in, in his or her system, does not necessarily mean that there's going to be an infection in progress or that any treatment needs to be taken. All right, so what questions do you all have, if any? All right.